All right, everyone. Hello. My name is Dylan Sipkowski. Um, today, myself and, and Conrad Vispo will be talking to you about Columbia County butterflies. This is a presentation we did as part of um, a Columbia Land Conservancy sponsored project called the Butterfly Project. And uh, people really enjoyed this presentation, so we're making it um, available to the public. So in this presentation, Conrad and I are going to be uh, introducing you to some general information about butterflies. Um, their, their, you know, what a butterfly is um, and how they relate to other kinds of insects, their aspects of their life cycle and ecology. And then Conrad's going to go in and Kind of uh, introduce you to the different kinds of butterflies that we have in Columbia County and um, aspects of the, the the conservation of these different butterflies. So to start, I'd like to introduce butterflies really broadly. So here we're looking at these are different kinds of flies. Here's a beetle, um, a bee. And I'm showing you this because these are all relatives um, of butterflies. These, these are other kinds of insects and butterflies are of course also insects. They are these um, animals, these arthropods that have segmented body parts, um, they have six legs, so so they're related to these other kinds of insects like dragonflies and beetles and bees. But butterflies are of course a certain kind of insect. Um, they belong to an order of insect, a kind of subgroup of insects, um, and and this order is called Lepidoptera. And Lepidopterans are are insects that have scale-covered wings. So here is a picture of a monarch from Claverack, New York, and at a glance, it doesn't look like this is a scaly insect. It doesn't look like a, it's covered with scales, but it must be because it is a Lepidoptera. Um, if you look closely, though, you'll see that this monarch is actually covered with all these different scales, which give it these different color patterns. Um, some scales are orange, and some are black, and some are white. And these scales are kind of look like fish scales up close, and they're made of some of the same uh, material as fish scales. Moths are also lepidopterans. Um, they are closely related to butterflies because they are these, these scale-covered insects. So here we have our largest moth in Columbia County. It's a, a large polyphemus moth, really impressive. Its wingspan is pr probably, you know, six inches or more for this individual. And if we look closely at this polyphemus wings, we'll see these, these scales that, that that um, cover its body and, and wings. So butterflies and moths have a lot in common, and some people struggle to tell them apart. Um, and there's not really a single difference between butterflies and moths. They have a lot in common. They're very closely related. They're both lepidopteran. You can really think as uh, of butterflies as a certain kind of moth that has adapted to fly during the day. But there are some general differences. Um, this is a species of butterfly called the peck skipper. And, and skipper butterflies, we have various species of these small skipper butterflies that hang, hold their wings together when they're, they're perched. And people sometimes think these are moths, but they're not. They're actually small, fast-flying butterflies, or many of them are fast-flying. And skippers and other butterflies, they have these club antennae. So this arrow here is pointing to the antenna of the skipper, and we can see it kind of bulges out at the end. Moths don't have this. Um, so that's one way you can tell moths and butterflies apart if you're able to get a close look at the Lepidoptera um, or if you're, if you're able to get a good photo. The so moths will have like a feathery antennae or, or um, their antennae will, will be kind of filamentous, they'll taper off at the end, but they won't have this club. So here we're looking at the polyphemous, polyphemous moth again, and it's got these big old feathery antennae. Um, this is a male, and it uses these antennae to, to, 
to detect pheromones released by female moths. And it will fly miles um, tracking down that female um, by following the, the, the scent trail using these antennae to, to detect that, that pheromone. This is a, a phylogenetic tree for Lepidoptera. Um, and, and at the base of the tree, the, the kind of furthest, the, the left part of this, this image, it kind of looks like a river system. Um, the furthest left of this, this tree, um, this is the most, that's the most ancestral kind of Lepidoptera. It was a, a moth that was around during the Jurassic period. And it, as this tree kind of moves to the right, you'll see it, it, it branches out. And this is showing the evolutionary divergence, um, the different evolutionary paths, different moths and butterflies have taken over over time. And one branch of this tree is, is the butterflies. So, so that's kind of one way to think about butterflies in relation to moths. They're all kind of on the same tree and, and butterflies represent one branch of that tree and all the other branches and twigs are the moths. Butterflies have a four stage life cycle. And I'd like to talk a little bit about this life cycle because it really ties into their conservation. And it's just a really fascinating life cycle that they have. So here's a little illustration I created, the life cycle of a black swallowtail, these large dark colored butterflies that we see in fields and other open areas. They feed on plants in the carrot family, but they're not they, they can be a pest in some contexts, but generally they're, they're not. They're, they're feeding on, unless you have a large commercial carrot farm, um, they might be a problem in that case. But for these small farms, um, they're, they're generally not a problem, and they are um, finding wild plants in the carrot family to feed their caterpillars, things like Queen Anne's lace. But as we can see in this illustration, there's... There's these four different stages of their life cycle, the egg stage up on top, into the caterpillar stage, and the caterpillar is creating some frass at the back end, the pupa stage or the chrysalis stage, and then the adult stage. And we've gone full circle to adult. It's going to reproduce and the females are going to lay eggs. So let's break down this life cycle a little bit, starting with the egg stage. These eggs can be really small. This is a, a wonderful photo by David Wagner. Uh, a butterfly and a lepidopterist from from uh, Connecticut, and this is of a very this is of an, the egg of a very rare butterfly called the northern metal mark. We have not seen this butterfly in Columbia County, but it might be here. This egg is is about half a millimeter wide, a very small thing, and it looks really bizarre. And it's kind of symmetrical shapes and. And it really almost looks alien. It's a, it's a really beautiful little thing. And, and so butterflies start off their egg, their, their life as these small eggs. And they come in different shapes and sizes depending on the species. This is the black swallowtail who we met before in that illustration. A much different looking egg. Very spherical. This looks like a, a, a moon or something. And... Where these eggs are are placed in the landscape, where a female uh, deposits her egg in the landscape is important. So here we have a, a, a landscape. Uh, this is the Greenport Conservation Area in Columbia County. And we can see there's these different kinds of, of environments in this landscape. We have the field here. We have, there's forest in the background. If you go down the hill, there's probably marshes along the Hudson River. And each each kind of habitat in this landscape is going to hold different kinds of plants. And butterfly caterpillars don't feed on any kind of plant. Usually they feed on, you know, a, a variety of plants or sometimes they'll just feed on on one genus or or one species of plant. Sometimes they're very picky eaters. So where a female butterfly lays her egg is really important because it, that egg is going to hatch into a caterpillar and that caterpillar needs to have access 
the food that is suitable to it, food that it can it can use. So in the case of a monarch, if a monarch lays its egg in the forest, it's probably not going to have access to its needed food, which are milkweeds. But if it lays its egg, you know, on these milkweeds right in the foreground of this photo, then that, that caterpillar will find food. And bringing it back to this middle mark, this middle mark feeds on on a, a plant that lives in a very specific kind of forested environment, these calcareous forests. It's called brown leaf ragwort. And that and and so that female middle mark butterfly has to seek out this plant. Um, the populations of this butterfly are probably restricted to areas having this plant. Um, and this plant is restricted to areas having these these conditions, these calcareous, the calcareous bedrock that 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 creates the right environment for this plant to grow. So, so the position of these eggs in the landscape is is important for the survival of the caterpillars. And there's threats to these cat these eggs. Um, they're very small, but there's little. There's little things out there looking to parasitize or, or prey upon these these eggs. Here's a small wasp laying her eggs inside of a beetle egg. So different wasps will will parasitize butterfly eggs. They'll lay their eggs inside the butterfly egg, and then the larva of that wasp will, will feed on the butterfly egg and, and will kill the butterfly. And here's a type of wasp that's known to attack butterfly eggs or to parasitize butterfly eggs. They can be very, very uh, small. This is a wasp next to a penny. So it's a very small wasp, and that probably helps it um, find these very small eggs. Um, and it's not necessarily a bad thing that wasps are out doing this in our environment. Uh, in many cases, it's a natural uh, process. Things are always um, being preyed upon, being parasitized in our environment. It's a natural process. However, there are some non-native parasitoids that have been intentionally introduced into our landscape, and they do um, they do threaten some of our, our Lepidopteran species. So if an egg is successful, um, if it's not attacked, um, if it's not unintentionally gobbled up by a deer while it's browsing, it might hatch into a caterpillar. These caterpillars often start small. These are some moth caterpillars, but butterfly caterpillars also start small. Um, they're usually caterpillar or butterfly eggs are usually laid um, singularly on an egg, so you won't see big bunches of them in most cases, like with some moths. But they're going to start small and they're going to eat a lot of food. Um, so this is an eastern comma butterfly. The adult is flying in early spring and in late fall because of how this species overwinters. We'll talk about that later. This eastern comma caterpillar is going to be feeding on nettle in forest. It's going to be eating as much nettle as it can, creating a lot of frass. Um, and it's going to be growing every um, now and again. It will shed its skin. It will do this five times throughout its this period of its life cycle. It'll shed its skin because it's eating so much food it needs to, to make room. It, it, skin, it outgrows its skin. It's a large black swallowtail, probably getting close to pupate, uh, probably getting close to, to enter that next stage of its life. And here's some frat. So as, as these butterflies are eating as much food of, as they can, they create lots of, of poop, um, like this monarch poop. And some of our butterfly caterpillars will never get all that big. So some of our skipper, um, these small butterflies we have that are sometimes uh, misidentified as moths, their caterpillars will never get all that big. They'll, they'll stay pretty small just because they're, they're small animals. But relative to when they just emerge from the egg, they will grow. And there's lots of threats to caterpillars. Caterpillars are really important parts of our food chain. 
they're providing crucial food to different kinds of animals like birds. Um, and other insects are, are preying upon them as well. This was a monarch caterpillar I was admiring in my backyard last year. And then one day um, I went out and it had been attacked by this immature bug. And again, this is a, a natural process. Uh, they're, they're feeding other animals in the landscape, and that's important. Here's a, this is actually a moth caterpillar um, that's been parasitized by, by a wasp. It's covered in these cocoons that the wasp has created on the outside of its body. And it's done that after that wasp larva had been feeding inside this caterpillar. So this happens to butterfly caterpillars as well. And again, there are some non-native, particularly a non-native fly, a cachinid fly that was intentionally released in our, in our region to combat the gypsy moth, um, that fly does attack some other Lepidoptera as well and, and, and is threatening populations of other Lepidoptera species. So there are some non-native parasitoids as well that, that can harm populations of these butterflies, but we have, of, of butterflies and moths, but we have many native parasitoids that, that have coexisted with moths and butterflies for a long time and, and aren't necessarily bad. After eating a whole bunch of food and, and kind of shedding their skin a couple a handful of times, um, and if they're successful in not getting eaten by birds or attacked by uh, insects, a butterfly will pupate. It will sometimes go to a new kind of micro habitat and, and will uh, form a pupa. The outside of its body will harden, and inside it will transform itself um, into slowly into an adult butterfly. And this period of its life, this is a, a, a vulnerable stage in a butterfly's life. They're immobile. Many butterflies overwinter as a pupa, and so they can provide a tasty snack to animals that are overwintering but not that are not dormant during the winter time, small mammals maybe, birds. Um, so they're often very cryptic, these pupa. Um, and sometimes they, they go to a new, as I noted before, they'll go to a new microhabitat or, or a new place altogether to form their pupa. So they're, they're not using that same place in the environment where their caterpillar is feeding. So you often find monarch pupa like, like this one away from milkweed. Maybe on some, some tomato, tomato plants, plants like, like this one was. So they're taking advantage of other kinds of habitats around them. This is the pupa of a very gorgeous butterfly called the Baltimore Checker Spot. The pupa kind of matches the adult. Um, this is kind of a flashy pupa. I'm not sure if it's trying to mimic bird poop um, or strategy. I'm not sure of the strategy for being, being so. Conspicuous compared to other people, but it is a gorgeous, gorgeous butterfly. Uh, and here's an angle wing people, this might be an eastern comma, very cryptic, um, kind of jagged. So, if that butterfly pupa is successful, if it's not eaten, um, and if the conditions are right, it, it, an adult will emerge from it. So bust through this pupa and out will crawl a butterfly, in this case a black swallowtail, which will slowly unfurl its wings. And then that butterfly will be looking to feed and to reproduce. So these butterflies will often be, you know, moving to a new kind of place in the landscape, maybe a new kind of habitat um, to utilize floral resources. And they're gonna be looking to find each other to reproduce and then that female is going to be looking to lay her eggs on a suitable host plant. We're going to give it a suitable host plant. So then we've gone full cycle. So that's a little bit about the butterfly life cycle. Um, but let's touch on butterflies in winter. I think it's a really interesting um, topic. Winters are difficult here in the Northeast. In Columbia County, we're situated in kind of south eastern New York, um, and, and in 
some years, winter, winter can be very harsh. So how do butterflies cope with these really cold temperatures? Well, they have two basic approaches. They 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 either have adapted to withstand really cold temperatures, or they migrate. So they just get out of town and it gets cold. For those that stay the winter, um, they have adapted to withstand cold temperatures in at least one stage of this life cycle. They can't tolerate all the, the water in their body freezing that will kill them. Um, so they, what they do is they, they produce glycerol when things get cold. and um, It's a chemical in the alcohol family. And that, that helps their body from, from freezing solid. And it helps the water in their body from freezing. So, so different butterflies will, will overwinter at different stages in their life. Uh, many of our hair streaks overwinter as, a, as an egg. So here's a coral hair streak. Overwinter is on the as an egg on the bark of trees. Um, the viceroy, this is a monarch mimic. It overwinters as a caterpillar. So, um, so its caterpillar will produce that glycerol and will stay frozen in our winter winter landscape until its host plant starts to leaf out again. Um, so this caterpillar feeds on willow plants and and. Uh, once those willow plants start to leaf out, uh, the caterpillar will, will kind of come back to life and will start resuming um, its feeding activity and will work towards completing its life cycle. So this adult viceroy that's pictured in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen has been maybe hit by a car or attacked by a bird, but it will not grow back to that portion of its wing that has been damaged. It's going to be uh, have a damaged wing for the rest of its life. The juniper hair streak um, overwinters as a, a, a pupa. This is a gorgeous green moth that's present in certain habitats in our landscape. It's overwintering as a pupa and might might provide a tasty snack for for some animal that finds it. And then we have some butterflies like this comma eastern comma that overwinter as adults. And, and because they overwinter as adults, they're the, the last butterflies we see flying in fall and, and the first ones we see flying in spring because they're already in that adult phase um, before and after their, their dormant period, the winter um, the period where, when they're spending the winter. So, so that these adult butterflies will find a rock crevice or a hole in a tree and and they'll go into this little this little shelter sheltered area and they'll produce some glycerol they'll spend their winter this way and again some species migrate um, so we have the monarch in the bottom left hand corner of the screen uh, these are some some american ladies and, and these butterflies get out of town when it gets cold so they don't need to produce this this chemical that helps their body not, not freeze solid. Just a whole other strategy for coping with, with cold weather. Butterfly conservation is, is, a, is a complex topic. We're hearing a lot in the news uh, in recent years about the butterfly apocalypse. You're seeing this in things like uh, articles in the New York Times, like, like this one. Uh, there's quite a bit of literature on the decline of insects at the global scale. Um, a lot of this decline, um, it's been suggested that this decline might be from, from the simplification of landscapes, habitat destruction, harmful inputs, pollution. Um, many different factors probably are stressing butterfly and moth and other insect populations and, and causing their decline at this global scale. In the Northeast, however, we're, we're, we're fortunate to have a really complex landscape. So habitat destruction that's driving insect decline in places like Western Europe or, or more simplified landscapes like you see in the Central Valley of California or the parts of the Midwest, um, 
that's not occurring here in the Northeast. We have a we have a largely forested landscape here in the Northeast. We have farms, but they're small, and they they actually can provide really important habitat to, to biodiversity in, in in some cases. We have different kinds of natural areas. We have this nice mosaic of habitats in our region, and this is good for biodiversity in general. Um, however, we're still seeing that there are that there might be that some butterflies, some butterfly species in our region might be in decline in terms of their populations, in terms of their abundance in our landscape. So this is some data um, compiled by the North America Butterfly Association. Um, it's, it's butterfly abundance across thir about 30 years in New York State. The data has been standardized. Abundant. Um, the data has been standardized. It's it's number of butterflies seen per individual surveying per amount of effort. Um, and and here we're looking about at population trends at abundance. Um, butter the abundance of two species of butterflies in New York across 30 years. The eastern tiger swallowtail on top, the silver spotted skipper on bottom. The eastern tiger swallowtail, what we're seeing in this graph, isn't too concerning. We're seeing some ups and downs. Where there doesn't seem to be any general trends. If you put a trend line in here, it'd probably more or less be more or less flat. And this year-to-year -year fluctuation, this is kind of normal for, for a lot of different animals. You have year-to-year um, -year variation in, in weather. Um, and other things might influence how abundant a species is in a particular year. However, below we're looking at the silver spotted skipper. This is a, a common butterfly. And there appears, across this 30 year period, there appears to be a downward trend in their abundance in the New York, in New York State. And that's concerning. You know, There could be a lot of things um, contributing to this. Seeing this downward trend indicates that there's something going on, and, and we're seeing the the, the same um, trend in other species of butterflies as well. Common species like the American copper and the pearl crescent appear to be coming or appear to be less common in recent years than they were just 30 years ago. And and why is this happening? Well, it, it could be many different things from climate change to habitat um, destruction to just changes in our landscape um, declines in, for in farmland in the northeast i'm not sure what's driving this but something is is contributing to some species of butterflies in our region becoming less common and it's really hard to identify exactly um, what is driving a species to undergo population decline, a butterfly species to undergo population decline, because butterflies are using so many different resources in their landscape. For example, this is a coral hair streak, and, and the eggs of this coral hair streak are using the bark on, on cherry trees. The caterpillars are using leaf litter to hide from predators during the day, and at night they're going into cherry trees and feeding on the leaves, or plum trees and feeding on the leaves. As a chrysalis, uh, they're, they're hiding in the leaf litter, and, and you can see this chrysalis and how adapted it is to camouflage itself in the leaf litter. And that, then as an adult, they're moving away from these forests, having cherry or plum, and they're, they're moving into old fields or other open lands that have certain kinds of flowers, flowers that they prefer, um, which uh, include different milkweed flowers or we've seen them on mountain mint or dog bane. So they're using different habitats and different microhabitats in the landscape. And we know of this butter, this particular butterfly species from just one, one site in Columbia County. Um, and, and yes, this site has cherry trees and it has old fields with its preferred flowers, but there's other sites in Columbia County that, that have these resources as well. Why isn't this butterfly at these other sites? Um, we don't know. Um, and, and it could be 
the land use history at this site. It could be a number of things. So there's all these different variables that influence where butterflies are and where, where they aren't. And that makes butterfly conservation um, a very tricky topic to wrap your head around. It makes providing conservation to a particular species difficult because we have to we have to pinpoint all the different variables they're using and and and, and yeah the conditions that, that make them that, that are suitable for them in the landscape. And going forward, uh, our program, the Farmscape Ecology Program, is seeking to get more people out looking for butterflies, sharing their observations, telling us where and when they're seeing different species. Because the more places we, we can, if we find coral hair streak in other places in Columbia County, we might be able to identify what these different places where they're found have in common. Um, and that will help us better understand what these butterflies need um, to exist in, in our landscape. So, so we do have um, an iNaturalist project, Atlas to Columbia County Butterflies. And we have information on our website on how to share your butterfly observations with us um, using iNaturalist or by just emailing us photos and information about your butterfly observations. So we'd, we'd really appreciate it if you um, helped us um, identify where and when butterflies are, are flying in Columbia County, New York. Um, so that sums up my part of the presentation, and Conrad Vispo is going to, um, in the next part of this presentation, going to go into more, in, more into depth um, about the different kinds of butterflies we have and, and the habitats uh, they use.